So thank you um, for inviting me to talk about this work. It's joint work with uh, Stefano and Matteo. And what we're trying to do in this paper is trying to estimate how households discount cash flows that occur in the extreme long run or the very long run. With, where with the very long run, we mean cash flows that occur 100, 200, or 300 years into the future. And the reason we find that an interesting question is that beyond the obvious implications that those discount ha rates have for asset pricing that Bob already alluded to in his lunch discussion, those discount rates are a crucial input into many economic questions that we're facing. Take climate change economics. Most of the debate is about a trade-off between reducing consumption and carbon dioxide emission today versus benefits, possibly uncertain benefits, that occur 100, 200, or 300 years in the future. And the outcome of any cost-benefit analysis that you might be conducting crucially depends on the discount rates that you apply to those very, very distant benefits. Now, the problem with choosing that discount rate is that there's very little direct empirical evidence on what you should choose. And as a result, the OMB, for example, and when, it, when it, they make suggestions to the federal agencies on what discount rates to use, they give a wide range of discounts, right? anywhere between 1% and 7% for what they call intergenerational projects. And they lament that you know, while markets provide a reference point for discounting within a generation, for extremely long periods, no comparable private rates exist. And so what we're trying to do with this paper is move somewhat towards closing this gap and trying to provide an estimate from market rates um, of what these discount rates are that households apply to these extremely long cash flows. Now, the problem is the empirical challenge that we're trying to overcome is that to do that, what you'd ideally want to do is you'd want to observe prices of cash flows at all maturities, right? But in practice, unfortunately, we only observe generally either the cash flows to in or the prices to infinite maturity assets, such as equities, or to relatively short maturity assets if they're limited. Think about bonds, which hardly ever go out more than 30 or 40 years, or dividend strips, which usually we even observe for fewer years. And so what we're using in this paper is we're exploiting a feature of residential real estate markets in both the UK and in Singapore um, to provide what we think are the first direct estimates of these very long-run discount rates. The feature that we're exploiting is the following. Residential, proper residential property ownership in these two markets comes in one of two forms. The first one is a freehold contract. That's essentially the permanent ownership of the asset, um, very similar to owning property in the US. However, in addition to these freehold contracts, in those countries, they're very common, um, it's a very common feature that properties also sell as leasehold contracts. Leasehold contracts are temporary ownership contracts that grant you ownership to the house for anywhere, for an initial duration from anywhere to, from 100 years up to 1,000 years. Now, there's a number of features of these leasehold contracts in those countries that, um, you know, that make us feel comfortable in using them in the way that we do. The first one is they're prepaid. So this is not like a commercial lease in the US where you make annual payments, but it's a complete upfront payment for the 200 or 300 year ownership of the asset. Secondly, there's very liquid secondary markets for those leaseholds. So if you buy a 300 year leasehold or a 400 year leasehold, 30 years in, you want to move, you can just sell the remaining 270, 370 years to the next guy. So, and, and, and what that allows us to do is it allows us to observe and, and you know, support for a large term structure of remaining leasehold durations for which we observe transaction prices. They trade for, broadly speaking, similar properties. So in the UK, about 25% of all properties are leasehold. So this is a very common contract structure that people that think about buying property in the UK are very, very familiar with what it means. And finally, there's very few constructual restrictions on leaseholders. So you might think if you look at your rental contract, it says you can't have pets, it says you can't smoke. These things don't generally exist in those leasehold contracts. And so to a first order approximation, the way we want to think about freeholds and leaseholds in this project is the following. The green line is just, an in, just the infinite flow of rents or, or, or dividends in some sense from, from this property that you're buying. And the freehold is the price you pay for the infinite stream of those dividends. The leasehold is just the price you pay for the first 100, 200, 300 years of that, of that dividend stream. Now, what would, what would sort of the most standard basic valuation model that we teach, you know, MBA students in their first year and undergraduates tell us that those two things should be priced at? Well, let's take the most basic model you know, it's deterministic, dividends grow at rate G, and they have an average rate of return of R. So the freehold would be just, you know, this is the equation that we use from, you know, pricing, pricing equities, D over R minus G. The leasehold is slightly different. What is it? Well, it's the price of the leasehold minus the present value of owning the leasehold at time T. So the price difference between a freehold and a leasehold gives us the present value of owning the leasehold in 200 years, 
said in other words, it gives us the fraction of the value of owning the, lease, the freehold today that comes from rents that accrue after the, the duration of the lease. So very simply, the discount, the price discount for an otherwise similar property between a T maturity leasehold and a freehold is given by this very simple equation here. Now if we plug in the estimated average real rate of return to housing of about 6, 6.5% and the estimated growth of rent of about 0.5%, you know, this suggests that for a 100 year leasehold, it should be trade at about 0.4% discount to the freehold. That's the intuition that you get when people discount climate change and damages 100 years ago at 6%, they say, well, if you do 0.94 to the 100, it basically has no present value today. Similarly here, all the, all the value of owning the property should come from the rent over the first 100 years. It shouldn't come from anything into the future. So what do we do in the paper? We construct a data set of all freehold and leasehold transactions in the UK and in Singapore. And we use that data set to actually estimate this term structure of leasehold discounts using hedonic regression techniques. We're also estimating average returns to housing and rent growth, these 6 and 0.5% that I mentioned, um, to kind of make sense of the results that we find. Um, and then we use them to actually learn about the long-run discount rate, right? How do people discount these cash flows 200, 300 years into the future? And we also try and split them up, though there we need to impose more structure onto the cash flow process. But we, we also try and tease out which component of this discount rate is a risk-free rate and which component is a, is a risk premium. Finally, we try and, and, and use our findings to at least discuss the implications for asset pricing, macroeconomics, and environmental economics. So let me give you the, the punchline of the paper. This is the punchline of the paper. It shows you the, lead, the lock point discount between a leasehold of duration that we see on this axis and an otherwise identical freehold. So let's pick this basket here. What does this basket tell us? It tells us that for an otherwise identical property, those that um, trade as a 100 to 125 year remaining lease, trade at about a 15% discount to an otherwise identical freehold. Remember, the basic Gordon growth valuation formula suggested that this should be in the order of magnitude of less than a percentage point, but it seems to be that in the data, it seems to be that people are assigning quite a large value to the rents that only come 100 or 120 years out into the future. What you also see is that for the extremely long end of that term structure, 700 and plus years, um, you basically see almost no discount between prices of, of freeholds and prices of leaseholds. And when I'm going to talk about possible alternative explanations of these discounts, I'll get back to that. Um, seems to stop working. Okay, so what do we take from that? Well, jointly, the high average rate of return to housing and these large discounts for long-term leases um, suggest a number of things to us. Firstly, it suggests that just looking at the average return of housing is quite uninformative about the discount rates in the very long run. Right? That's the idea of the Gordon growth model failing in producing those discounts. Um, it suggests that the long run discount rates are actually very low. Um, it also suggests the downward sloping term structure of discount rate that's consistent with the evidence that Bob mentioned um, in his talk today. And there's also a conclusion that I won't belabor today, which is that many leading asset pricing models struggle to qu even qualitatively match this, right? Because um, as Bob said, you know, they would suggest an upward sloping term structure of discount rate rather than the downward sloping term structure that we find here. Beyond that, if you believe that long run housing is a risky asset, and I'm going to show you some evidence that suggests that it is, it tells us two things. It tells us that long run risk free rates have to be very low. But it also tells us that long run risk premia alone, if you think there's a high quantity of risk, it has to say that the price of risk in the very long run is relatively low. Again, in direct contrast to what the asset pricing models tell us it should be in order to rationalize the equity premium. OK, what's the data that we're looking at? I'm going to only show you results for the UK. Singapore looks very, very similar. We're going to use administrative data on all leasehold transactions and lease terms since 2009 gives us about 2 million transactions, about a quarter of those are leasehold properties. We recently purchased data all the way back to 1995 that will allow us to look at the time series of those discount rates, something that Bob and, um, encouraged us to do in, in his lunch talk. We're hoping to get there. Property characteristics are from rightmove.co.uk. It's basically the Zillow of the UK. They have, um, you know, they have property listings and all of that, and we get a large number of property characteristics. What I'm showing in those two graphs at the bottom here is just the distribution of remaining lease lengths at the point in which we see the transaction to give you a sense of the support that we have in, in the data. So these ones here are the initial 999 year leases and those we see with remaining lease lengths anything up to 800 years. 
And then we also observe transactions with least length anything from between 70 and 80 years here up to 250 years. So what's the specification that we're running? In fact, it's quite a simple hedonic regression specification where we regress the log price that we observe at the transaction point on, in the, in the second row, what you see is interacted fixed effects of zip, of postcode, which in the UK is actually a very, very narrowly defined geographic unit, by time and by property type. So we're comparing, you know, we're comparing flats sold in the same postcode at the same point in time. We're going to be controlling for all of these stuff that we get from right move, right? Age, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, property size, all, you know, observable characteristics on which these properties might differ on. And then we're going to be including these buckets in terms of remaining lease length um, and so giving, us a sen you know, giving us a sense of the pro uh, percentage price discount for an otherwise similar property selling you know, in the same month, same, same, um, same postcode and so on, but with, um, with you know, duration of whatever the basket is relative to the freehold. So this is a graph I've already showed you. I want to talk a bit more about it now that I've put the specification on the table. Um, as I said, first of all, notice that those discounts, the magnitude of them is, um, is orders of magnitude bigger than what the Gordon growth model would have predicted they should be. I told you I'm going to come back to this more than 700 years remaining. Because one of the key worries that you have in terms of looking at these discounts, in fact, you might have two types of worries. One of them will be addressed in particular by this. You might say, well, you can control for all the observable characteristics on which leaseholds and freeholds differ. But there's all going to be all these unobservable characteristics that you can't control for. And maybe leaseholds are just unattractive on these unobservable characteristics. First of all, the, you know, if you think that's the case, or if you think, well, maybe there is something different about the contractual structure. Maybe these covenants you know, that, that you know, we don't observe in the data, but maybe they're there. Maybe there's something that you can't do with a leasehold that you can with a freehold. And maybe that's why people are willing to pay the premium for the freehold relative to the leasehold. But all of these things should show up along the entire term structure. That shouldn't be something that gets, you know, it's a bigger deal for 100 to 124 year um, lease remaining relative to 125 to 149 should also be there for the 700 and plus. And so the fact that those ones trade at an identical price to the otherwise identical controlling for the observables freehold makes us less worried that we're, that, you know, we're missing a significant large number of unobservable characteristics amongst um, which those one would differ. We also estimate these discounts just within the leasehold category. So we, you know, we, we take the 999-year leases as the excluded category rather than the freehold. Again, that would keep all these constra contractual concerns that you have and restrictions on you as a, as a leaseholder would keep those constant. And even in that specification, we control for the initial lease length because you might think, well, you know, the unobservable characteristics might vary with initial lease length. Well, even when we control for that, those discounts remain almost identical. So these are the key takeaways from the data. We have a sizable discount for these relatively long-run leaseholds. The slope of the term structure suggests that the discounts are related to the remaining lease length. The fact that the 700-year-plus leasehold is priced identical to the freehold suggests that it's less likely that there is you know, systematic unobserved structural heterogeneity between these freehold and leasehold properties. It also makes it less likely that these discounts are driven by these covenants that you, you might expect some freeholders to put on their leaseholders. Um, I told you that we found similar discounts when comparing leaseholds with different maturity. You know, and, and that keeps the contract structure the constant because you're just comparing two similar contracts. The only thing is the duration for which they last. The results we take away from that are almost identical. And as I already said, that's all I'm going to say about Singapore. We have the same data. We run the same analysis. The discounts look very similar in an otherwise very different you know, housing market structure. So this is not something that's just to do with how the UK housing market is structured. You find very, very similar things in Singapore. Other possible explanations that we address that I just wanted to put up there, you might think that even if the houses are very similar, you might think there's different bias for freeholds and leaseholds. So one thing that worried us is, are the freeholds just being bought by people that, um, that don't have children, that don't have maybe a bequest motive, and something along those lines. When we look in the data, conditional on property type, it is actually the characteristics of people that own freeholds and people that own leaseholds are almost identical. You know, the, the difference in the weekly wage is only about five pounds between them. Um, the number of household members is, you know, 0.02 bigger for the, for the leasehold members. So it's not that, you know, they don't have dependent children or something like that, and that's what's driving the results. And finally, we were worried that maybe this is driven by, um, by financing friction, which was the only 
alternative explanation that we could come up with that would vary in how problematic it is by remaining lease length. Because in the UK, banks require at least 30 years to be remaining at the, at the end of the lease before they would mortgage finance it. And that's obviously a problem that gets bigger the closer you, you know, the, the, the closer the you know, remaining lease length runs out. Um, the reason why we don't think that's the case is the following. Even if this was the case, we, would, we might expect this to affect the value of um, you know, a 70 or 80 year lease, right? Where these financing constraints must, might start binding at some point in the future. But think about the following. Think about having a 250 year lease, right? For which we observe an 8% discount relative to the otherwise identical freehold. If the only constraint is that once the lease length runs down to 70 years, in 180 years from now, you lose the collateral value of the house. If that was the only thing why you would pay this more, right? Discounting that at conventional discount rates for the 180 years to the point when you still have 250 years remaining should again, for the very same logic that I put up before, essentially not affect the price discounts that we observe. Okay, um, very briefly, I told you we also estimate r rate of returns on housing and, um, and rent growth. Um, they're fairly consistently across countries and time periods, somewhere around 8%. The key what's driving this is a rental yield. It's not, asset, it's not capital gains. So this is Schiller's point, right? There isn't a huge amount of real capital gain. It's all coming from you know, fairly high dividend yields. And they're somewhere between 8% and 0.5% and, you know, we take as our rent growth. All the, all the methodology and how we do this is in the paper. Just to say that those numbers in particular on the highly high average rate of return to housing are actually quite consistent with housing being quite a risky asset. So what we try to do here is we try and look at all the, you know, the big risks that we worry about in asset pricing. You know, we look at financial crises. We look at the Reinhard Rogoff dates. We look at the Barrow dates. And you know, we try and assemble a, you know, a long panel time series data set of house prices across many countries and going as far back as data is available. And what we find is that you know, house, housing generally does very badly following financial crises. It generally does badly in barrow crises. House price growth and consumption growth are positively correlated. So all of these things that make housing a risky asset um, seem to be there and they seem to be consistent with it as a result having a relatively high average rate of return you know, that we also estimate in the data. Okay. Very briefly, could we have learned about those discounts rates, you know, those low discount rates of the long run, by looking at theory, right? Previously there was no data, but is this all surprising in terms of theory? Well, the joint result of finding these high returns on high leasehold discounts, I already told you that the deterministic Gordon growth model fails, right? That gave you a 0.4% price discount between the freehold and the 100-year lease, and I showed you that in the data it's 15% or more. So that doesn't help. In addition, since housing is risky, most general equilibrium asset pricing models, as I already said, and as Bob alluded to, predict an upward sloping or flat term structure of discount rates. So that's Jules' paper that, that, that Bob mentioned. And so rather than belabor the point, all I want you to do is show you a graph of the magnitudes of the discounts that we observe in the data, which is the red line here, and the discounts that are predicted by you know, the, the Gordon growth model, which is the blue one, and then you know, the long run risk model of Banzai Yaron, the rare disasters of Barrow and Gebex, and the habits model, the Campbell and Cochrane that, that Bob talked about. So what I'm arguing is that at least from the, from the sort of the, the, the standard models that we use, the accepted models, they would have given us no guidance. In fact, they would have guided us the wrong way in terms of how we should think about those discount rates at the extreme long run. What we're doing here is just trying, rather than providing a model, what we're just trying to do is we're just trying to provide a reduced form, functional form, of what the term structure of discount rates would have to look like in order to match both the high average rate of return to housing as well as the, um, as well as the leasehold discounts we observe. And here's just two of them. Essentially, a hyperbolic or a downward sloping functional form gets quite a lot of the way there. Um, OK, so let me come back to my initial motivating example of, um, of climate change as why we think that those long-run discount rates are important, besides providing this testing ground for our asset pricing theories. So the idea is that, you know, in, in this literature for many, many years, by now say decades, there's just been this fight on what the appropriate discount rates are that we should apply to, you know, climate damage long into the future. And so Nick Stern in the Stern Report, probably one of the most influential pieces, at least on the policy side of climate change, suggests that we shouldn't discount at all because it's just ethically unfair to discount future generations who have no say and no voting power today. Um, 
On the other hand, you know, Marty Weitzman and Nordhaus and Pindic, they've argued for higher rates. Um, generally, what they've argued is we should just take the rate of return to capital, right? Capital return six or seven percent. That should be our discount rate. Essentially, that's applying the Gordon growth model logic to use a, you know, to, to look at the average rate of return to try and predict what the long run discount rates are that I showed is at least within housing. Um, inconsistent with the discount rates that households seem to apply over those horizons. Yeah. I agree. I, so all I'm saying is within that literature, people have argued for anything from zero to seven or eight or nine percent. So the range and the range that has been used has been wide. And in fact, that sort of difference between rates applied is from my reading from that literature, in fact, the key driving force about people arguing what should be done about climate. It's not the climate models that they run. And it's not, it, it is, you know, no matter what your climate model is, if you discount something 150 years out at 7%, you're not going to care about it today. Um, and so what we find in the data is these low overall long run discount rates. Now, as I said before, they include a, they include a risk free discount rate and they include a risk premium. And, um, and so in order to sort of tear them apart and then try and apply them to another asset, investment in climate change technology, we need to make some assumptions on the quantity of risk of this long run housing to tweak out what risk premium are. And so what we're doing here so far, and you know, we're trying to pin this down even more tightly, but so far we're saying if long run housing is, housing is risky, what does this mean? It means the risk premium has to be at least weakly positive. That means that long run risk free discount rates are relatively low, right? Because even if housing is completely risk-free, the 1% or 1.5% discount rate for the long run we're picking up is all risk-free. That's much lower than, than what we would usually take. And in particular, as housing becomes more and more risky, the risk premium component still stays small and has to basically, as you think it becomes more risky, the price of risk has to decline because obviously, in some sense, the riskiness times the price of risk captures the risk, the risk premium component. So what are the implications of this for climate change policy? Well, it suggests that there's a relatively high willingness to pay in order to reduce very long run climate costs for sure, right? That's just taking the idea of having a fairly low risk free rate of interest. But it also seems to suggest that there's less willingness to pay to just reduce uncertainty about climate outcomes, right? Because the price of these long run risks seem relatively low. That's just one way of how you, know, how you try and take these discount rates that we find in real estate, make some more structural assumptions, and then try and apply them to climate change, to intergeneral fiscal policy, and issues like that. So what do we do in the paper? We try and exploit a unique feature of housing markets in the UK and in Singapore to bring a data point, where we think the first data point of direct estimates of these very, very long run discount rates. Um, we find them to be very low. In fact, much, much lower than suggested by most asset pricing models. So this isn't something you could have just gotten by looking at you know, a theoretical prediction. In fact, you would have gone the wrong way. In order to match expected returns, the term structure of discount rates needs to be downward sloping. That's consistent with the recent evidence um, that's been discussed. And, um, and it suggests that there's low long run risk free rates and also a low, pr low price of long run risk. And you know, these are important inputs for many policy questions. Um, climate change policy I discussed. But there's a lot of other issues where you'd have to essentially intergenerationally discount where you know, we, we hope we can start providing some guidance on what appropriate discounts rate are. Thank you. So here it's about 1.5%. 1.5. Yeah, actually, I was uh, wondering whether you could present it also as a forward curve, forward rate curve. I mean, it would be uh, better to digest. Um, I mean, generally, you could generate any of this curve if you have the right mean reversion in the GDP growth rate. So it would be interesting to backward engineer. Let's say you take a total expected utility maximizer, risk aversion, or not three or something, and see what properties of the long run mean reversion do I need to generate this. So it could be that you know over 300 years the uncertainty is not very high, while over the next 10 years it's very high because you know on average it washes out, and then you could probably get closer to your result. So then it would be, if you're interested, you know, is it really driven by a preference aspect like hyperbolic discounted, or is it really driven by the how we foresee the future GDP growth over the next hundreds of years. 
Yeah, no, I think that's, that point is exactly right. So that's why I said we need to impose this structure if long-run housing is risky. Basically, what you're saying is if rents are a mean reverting process, then the long run is never risky, and then therefore all we're picking up is essentially the risk-free rate of, of return. So in some sense, the data is the data, and then the extent to which you try and learn about it, risk-free rate versus preferences for risk, um, requires you to impose some restrictions. So we're trying to look at you know, whether or not rents for hundreds of years, there's very bad data on this, but we're trying to see other stationary or trans-stationary processes to try and figure out how realistic this mean reversion assumption is. The other way to go is exactly what you're suggesting. Try and figure out you know, what types of mean reversion properties could re reverse engineer these. But you're exactly right. There is an assumption in there on the, on the rent process um, and if you believe that they're mean reverting very quickly, so that by 100 years out, essentially these things are risk-free, all we're picking up is the risk-free rate of, 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 of interest, even that is much lower than a lot of models assume. So at the worst, if you're, if you're, happy, to, you know, if you're happy to say they're not a hedge, then you know, we can at least learn about that component. If you're happy to buy more of the structure, we can learn about risk preferences. Too. Let me just add to the environmental uh, conclusion. So of course, when you look at the Stern re review, it's all about the preference discount rate, while Marty Weitzman, it's all about the riskiness. An environment is very different, so there's no potential mean reversion. I mean, the whole thing might just blow up. And this big tail events, that drives the discount rate in, in his setting. No, absolutely. So that's why we're trying to split it up. And um, three points. First, uh, I, I, I think some a conclusion that I have reached, and I think an awful lot of other people have reached uh, in the last few years, is that is basically there's no way to understand you know vast amounts of uh, observed behavior under the assumption that there is one discount rate that everyone shares. So what you are getting effectively, I think, is uh, some marginal, some discount rate for the marginal person who is on the border between buying the leasehold and a freehold. And I think it's hard to make a case for why that particular peculiar subset of people ought to be the set of people whose preferences value climate change um, for the next thousand years. Um, if I, I don't have a compelling alternative to how you answer that question, but I, I think it's, uh, it's a very dubious proposition that that tiny fraction of people is the, it, it has some standing uh, to be the right set of people. Um, a second point is that uh, you briefly suggested that the uh, pattern of um, discount rates by time, uh, by the duration, I guess is the right term, um, is not consistent with geometric uh, discounting, but you need some, some hyperbolic kind of uh, uh, pattern. Um, but that raises a, a, a whole host of other problems because as David Labson has taught us, uh, when you have non-geometric discounting, or really as Richard Strotz told us in 1957, I think, um, there are, you know, potentially many different uh, not utility rankable uh, uh, outcomes that uh, y you, that would arise under various different uh, assumptions about the available commitment mechanisms. And of course, uh, deeply embedded in all discussions about climate change um, are the assumptions that are made about commitment mechanisms. So if the discount rates that even your privileged freehold versus leasehold guys um, exhibit, and we're willing to admit that they are the ones who should value climate change, um, we still don't have an answer uh, because the appropriate policies will depend critically on the auxiliary assumptions you make about can nations make binding agreements on things like uh, climate change. Um, I, I wonder, finally, whether um, the whole, um, this whole way of thinking about things is problematic in the sense that, uh, you know, Danny Kahneman has made some pretty compelling arguments that people just don't think very clearly about uh, things that they haven't had much experience with. 
and events that are 700 years in the future are things that we haven't, on any of us, had very much experience with. So the privileged freehold versus leasehold marginal buyer uh, may be even less compelling as, uh, 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 from, from, from that uh, point of view. Yeah, so let me start backwards on the last one in terms of um, people not having experience over those horizons. I think in some sense that's possibly true. Though the setting we're looking at here is you know, the largest financial decision that most households make in their lifetime. So to the extent that they have the ability with a lot of thinking down to figure out what their time and risk preference over those horizons are, this would be the one asset where I would trust the most in terms of being able to elicit it um, relative to an alternative where you might ask them just in a survey, you know, make those trade-offs. You can imagine these guys are sitting down and really thinking hard when they're comparing freehold and leasehold properties. The that, second one that is- It sort of requires them to know the answer to the question that you don't know the answer to, which is the stationarity of the growth process and the risk, of, risk components of the growth process. And if you don't know the answer, I doubt they do. No, I mean, so second part. In terms of the, you know, the hyperbolic and the time inconsistency elements that come along with it and all the problems that that, that creates in terms of policy analysis. Um, in some sense, when, you know, when I showed you the shape of the term structure that would be needed to explain both the high average rate of return and the large discounts we observe, I was trying to be very explicit that this is a reduced form. You know, this is just trying to give us some guidance on where models need to go in order to match this particular fact in the data. Now, we weren't, we're not suggesting that the hyperbolic model in terms of the beta delta or you know, some sort of more, more complicated parametric specification of it that pro is the right way to go. It's just, in some sense, if you believe those two data points, that's what a model needs to produce. And we're, we're not there yet where you can say this is the model that does end up producing it. Um, and so in terms of the very first one, to what degree do we believe prices elicit preferences because they're priced by the marginal guy? I think, I think that's in some sense a fair comment and people probably different in their discount rates. I would hazard to say that that's a problem that we're facing in almost in, in a lot of economics where we, you know, we, we're thinking about a representative agent and we're trying to back out preferences by looking at actions. So I'm sympathetic to that point. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a broader concern in terms of interpreting you know, prices and trying to back out preferences. I don't think it's any more of a concern here than it is in a lot of other of these types of analysis that we do. For example, the, the EPA trying to just discount at the average rate of return to capital, which is also priced by a marginal guy, and it's less clear whether that marginal guy is more right or wrong than the other marginal guy. So I think that's a bigger question in terms of to what degree we can learn from, a, from you know, the price of an asset price by one marginal guy about the entire distribution of preferences that people might have. And you know, it's, a, it's a bigger question that you know, we are not addressing here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. For <laughs> Do you want to say something? I just wanted to say a last word of uh, thank you to everybody who came here, and especially to the ones who hanged out till the end. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it was a great event. And um, again, thanks to everybody. Thanks for Violetta for putting everything together, for Nancy and the whole team, and um, uh, the keynote speaker, and Atif, and everybody uh, who was instrumental in putting this together. Thank you. Thank you.